Welcome to God and Country Radio. Weekend program discusses current social, political, economic, and prophetic events in the light of biblical theology. I'm your host, Pastor Brad Winship, Pastor of Horror Bible Church in central New Jersey, exit 120 of the Garden State Parkway. On this week's program, I'd like to discuss the age-old biblical moral question of, is it right to personally criticize others? Or rather, when is it right to personally criticize others? I've never met a Christian who has not wrestled with this issue at some time. You ask, well, what's the controversy? Let me give it to you in a nutshell. In the Old Testament, the law of God states, in Exodus 22:28, you shall not curse God, nor curse the ruler of your people. So in Acts 23, when the Apostle Paul was on trial before the Sanhedrin, the high priest ordered Paul to be slapped. So Paul responded back, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law, and in violation of the law, order me to be struck? Well, good for Paul. We all need to learn to have a little more backbone and rebuke evil leaders when they violate God's law. And notice that Paul didn't just point out the error. He called the high priest a name. He gave him a label to describe the evil. Being called a whitewashed wall is being called a hypocrite, a fake, a phony. The high priest at this time was Ananias, and Paul was in effect calling Ananias fake Ananias. Some of you have probably figured out where I'm going with this politically. Well, a bystander said to Paul, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul responded, I wasn't aware, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it's written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Remember, Paul had trouble with his eyesight, so he really didn't know who was speaking. And notice it was Paul himself who brought up the Old Testament law concerning criticism of rulers. But this brings up another question. What if the person was not a high priest, but a private citizen, or just running for the office of high priest? Could you criticize him then? And what exactly does speaking evil mean? If you're telling the truth about some leader, are you speaking evil? Are we not allowed to point out the error of our leaders? Or does this just mean we're not to point out the error of leaders in an evil or untruthful way. In Matthew chapter 14, the prophet John was arrested by King Herod because John said it was unlawful for Herod to marry his brother's wife. Herod didn't allow anyone to threaten his legitimacy to rule in Israel. The prophet John believed it was necessary to let the people know that Herod was breaking the law of God. Jesus called Herod a fox. Luke chapter 13, verse 32. And Jesus said to them, Go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I reach my goal. This was not a compliment. He was calling Herod an animal. This was probably less of an insult than calling him a pig or a dog, but really not that much different. So apparently in some cases, it's acceptable to describe the character of some people in terms of an animal, a sloth, a wolf, a lemming, a vulture, an ostrich, a parasite, a jackass. Now, all of these animals have well-known characteristics that are commonly used to describe the character of some people. But then we also have some serious words from Jesus against criticizing others In Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. So needless to say, Christians are very hesitant to call a fool a fool. But then we read in Matthew chapter 23, verse 17, that Jesus himself calls the Pharisees fools. 
you fools and blind men, along with calling them hypocrites in every other sentence. One could easily describe Matthew 23 as Jesus unloading on the Pharisees. We're going to put them on the cross. So apparently there is a place for calling someone a fool if it's said in truth. Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount likely refer to calling someone a fool unjustly, calling someone a, a fool when it's not true. Now someone might say, remember this is Jesus. And God is permitted to make judgments that we're not permitted to make. However, as God incarnate, as a man, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law of God required for man. Now, in the New Testament, we read texts such as Titus chapter 3, verse 2, to malign no one. This is the word for blasphemy. Blasphemeo in the Greek, which has a very broad meaning to slander, to revile, to speak evil of someone. And then there's James chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore put aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. However, we have the apostles and the Apostle Paul in the New Testament calling people out and, and naming their evil. Second Timothy chapter 4, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourselves, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Or Galatians chapter 2 verse 11, Paul withstood Peter to his face because of Peter's hypocrisy. And Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul writes, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Now, the term false circumcision describes unbelieving Jews, and it was a term that would greatly offend any Orthodox Jew. I mean, how could you call us false? What an insult. And in the book of the Revelation, the Apostle John calls the synagogues of the Jews the synagogues of Satan. Twice, Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9. And Paul writes that we're to mark out or name those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, as Paul himself did. 1 Timothy 1.20, he named and warned the churches about Hymenaeus and Alexander, who Paul handed over to Satan so that they would be taught not to blaspheme. So they were blaspheming, speaking evil against Paul in the gospel, but Paul was justified in speaking against them because Paul was right according to the word of God. So you see why this whole issue of criticizing the faults of others can be a real dilemma for Christians. On the one hand, there are these texts prohibiting malicious criticism, but on the other hand, Jesus and the apostles and the prophets engage in what was clearly considered in that day hurtful criticism. That's why I never met a Christian who has never wrestled with these issues at some time during their life. Taking all of these scriptures together, the answer is most likely that unjust lying criticism is wrong, but true criticism is acceptable. But even then, in telling the truth, we must examine our motives. We must be careful because all people are still made in the image of God, so we must not curse or damn them. James chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, we can be colorful and uh, we can be descriptive, but we must be true. In fact, criticism of evil people is not an option. God actually calls us to speak up against evil people. Now, we know some people who consider themselves virtuous because they never criticize anyone. They live by the code of not offending anyone, as if that's being a model Christian. Uh, as if the world would be a wonderful place if people only spoke positively. Well, sure, everyone will love you. But as Jesus said, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Uh, yes, you're going to be loved by the world because you say only nice things, but you'll never change anyone for good by just being nice. Jesus often rebuked the disciples. 
And our ministry for Christ is a corrective ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. So here's an example of all this. Of course, a political example. Donald Trump is known for his criticism of his opponents, labeling them with names such as Sleepy Joe, uh, Crazy Nancy, and the latest is Comrade Kamala. Now, Barack Obama in his speech at the DNC last week called it childish nicknames. But then Obama made an off-color joke about Trump's anatomy, which was even more childish. Well, anyway, there's been a call from certain people for Trump to tone down the rhetoric, the criticism, the Trumpisms, if he's to win the 2024 election. I even talked to Christians who support Trump but regret his criticism and his bluster, his calling of Kamala and, and Joe Biden as dumb and stupid. But then I'm reminded of the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 11. Isaiah writes, the princes of Zoan are mere fools. The advice of Pharaoh's wisest advisors has become stupid. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. For my people are foolish. They do not know me. They're stupid children and have no understanding. They're shrewd to do evil, but to do good, they do not know. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 8. Concerning idolaters, but they're altogether stupid and foolish in the discipline of their delusion. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 21, concerning political leaders, for the shepherds have become stupid and have not sought the Lord. So are the critics of Trump's criticism being righteous and biblical, or have they been so deluded and softened by the moral relativism of the culture that they don't know how to call evil, evil? So in thinking about this program and this issue, just so happened that Trump was speaking in North Carolina and he asked this question of the audience. Should I or shouldn't I tone it down? Quote, Kamala ruined San Francisco. She ruined California. And if she gets in, our country doesn't have a chance. This calamity is on Comrade Kamala Harris's shoulders. I think her name will be Comrade because I think that's the most accurate name. I've been looking for a name. People are saying, sir, don't do it. You know all my names. Uh, they, they've all worked. They've all been very successful. And I really didn't find one for her. But sir, no, she's a woman. I said, so is Hillary Clinton. And I called her Crooked Hillary. Nobody complained about that, right? I call people names. I called crazy Nancy Pelosi crazy because she is. She's nuts. Did you see Barack Obama last night take little shots? He was taking shots at your president, and so is Michelle. They always say, sir, please stick to policy. Don't get personal. And yet they get personal all night long. Do I still have to stick to only policy? Now, Obama was very nasty last night. I try to be nice to people, but it's a little tough when they get personal. But people say to me, please, sir, don't get personal. Talk about policy. So let me ask you about that. We're going to do a free poll. Here are the two questions. Should I get personal or should I not get personal? Unquote. So even Donald Trump is asking this question and the audience response was a little unclear. J.D. Vance was asked this question by the media and he gave a great answer. Quote, I think one of the things people actually love about Donald Trump in politics is he's not unwilling to speak off the cuff. He says what's actually on his mind. He's not always filtered. I think that's a good thing and part of his appeal. To people who say that Donald Trump should do something different, they had an opportunity to make Donald Trump do something different by challenging him over three separate primaries. Every single one of them he won. So I think Donald Trump has earned the right to run the kind of campaign he wants to run. Now, if you listen to what Donald Trump says, and if you look at what I say, we are prosecuting the case against Kamala Harris on policy. We're taking aim at Harris. 
We much rather have an American president who is who he is, who's willing to offend us, who's willing to tell us the truth, who isn't a fake and hiding behind a teleprompter. Unquote. And what Vance says is true. Trump's speeches are mostly pointing out Kamala's failed policies, and then Trump will just interject a few labels. Now, realize that the media is selectively highlighting Trump's labels as personal attacks and ignoring all of the personal attacks coming from the Democrats against Trump. I mean, they're not asking Kamala or any of her political supporters, don't you think you are offending the public and offending Trump by personally attacking him, by indicting his motives, by saying he doesn't care about the people? I mean, that's what we constantly heard at the DNC convention. But the media would never call the Democrats out on this. But if Trump says a word of criticism against Kamala, it makes headlines and Trump is depicted as a horrible person. This is really a game the media is playing and and even Christians get influenced by media propaganda. And so even the Christian community begins to wonder if Trump is getting too personal. I mean, we're not offended, but we start to get offended for others vicariously because we hear that others are offended. But let's not fall for the propaganda. The media is creating an illusion, a fake outrage over Trump. People are not as offended by Trump as the media makes it out to be. And in watching the DNC convention last week, Trump has not made nearly as many malicious comments against Kamala Harris as Harris has made against Trump. Really, the only ones who are offended by Trump's labels are the ones being criticized. And maybe they ought to be offended. That kind of criticism is the only thing that keeps many of these politicians from thinking that everyone loves them so they can go full communism. The one thing politicians can't stand is being exposed as being hypocrites and being ignorant. Now, we all know that all of the major media outlets conspire together to promote a certain narrative. Amazingly, they all use the same wording and the same slant on stories. This is no coincidence. For example, there was a recent montage of all of the leftist political commentators calling J.D. Vance weird. That wasn't happening by accident. So apparently the word went out to criticize what they're calling Trump's personal attacks on the Democrats. My guess is that they're doing it for a number of reasons. Number one, it gives them something to talk about rather than the issues. Number two, it can be used to paint Trump in a bad light. And number three, Trump's labels are effective. What Trump says does stick in the mind of the public. No one would hear that Kamala is a communist unless the Republican candidate said so. Nobody would have known that Biden's health was failing and he couldn't be an effective president unless someone said so. Nobody would know about the problems at the southern border unless someone spoke up and called it what it is, an invasion. So for all those Republicans who think the way to win the public is to be nice and never criticize Democrats, they really don't know how things work in real life and with real people. To win, one has to say the truth. And you have to say it with a certain amount of shock value. Don't imagine that people read between your lines and figure out for themselves that Kamala Harris is a communist or is foolish or is not the brightest bulb in the chandelier. You have to come out and say it. I believe it's necessary that we call evil evil, that Trump's vivid descriptions are really necessary. Now, Nikki Haley recently said that she wants Trump to win the presidential election, but said the campaign is not going to win talking about crowd sizes. It's not going to win talking about what race Kamala Harris is. It's not going to win talking about whether she's dumb. You can't win on those things. The American people are smarter. Treat them like they're smarter, unquote Nikki Haley. Well, from my perspective, Nikki Haley is superimposing her own deeper understanding of politics on the American public. The public actually needs to hear the truth about Kamala in simple terms. That Kamala Harris is not as popular as the media make her out to be. The crowd sizes are small. And that Kamala Harris has used her racial identity 
as it suits her to get ahead. And that Kamala Harris is not the brightest bulb in the chandelier. There's a piece that came out back in July in the UK Daily Mail entitled Kamala Harris, Soul Destroying Bully. Former Kamala staff exposes shocking details of degrading tirades, decade-long toxic behavior that left people in tears and saw them quit at unprecedented levels. Behind the recent public self-branding of Harris as a kindly, jovial Mamala, she has earned a nasty behind-closed-doors reputation as an alleged soul-destroying workplace bully. She's extremely insecure. Staffers have had to create mock situations to prepare her for public events. Quote, multiple staffers who worked for Harris before she was vice president told the Washington Post in December of 2021 how she reportedly refused to prepare for public appearances and blamed her aides when she then underperformed. With Kamala, you have to put up with a constant amount of soul-destroying criticism and also her own lack of confidence. So you're constantly sort of propping up a bully and it's never really clear why. So wow. That is not what we saw in her prepared speech at the DNC last week. In the videos about her background and her defense of helpless people. And it's not what we heard in the -the over-the-top compliments given to her by other politicians. Remember, Kamala Harris was one of the first Democrats to drop out of the Democrat 2020 primary because she was so unpopular and got such few votes. It's been well said that the 2024 election will be a great test of the power of the media to take someone who is disliked and transform her into a godlike figure. By the way, there are quite a few articles online that report that Kamala is a heavy drinker. The Democrats are denying this as false rumors, but there is some convincing testimony. Last week, I watched PBS cover the DNC convention, and at a PBS roundtable discussion, the old-school Democrat journalist Judy Woodruff, age 78, said something that shocked everyone at the table. She said, we really don't know who Kamala Harris is. And Woodruff said that even after the entire week of people standing up saying good things about Kamala Harris. Well, let me conclude by saying I don't have all the answers for when it's right and wrong to give personal criticism, but I do know this. We have to warn people and we have to give people the truth. And we have to say in a way that gets people's attention. It's a great error that people get deluded into playing nice and not revealing the truth about evil. If a church was voting on a new pastor, would you speak up if you knew he didn't qualify? If he made himself out to be something he was not? So here's a thought. Rather than the problem being that Trump is being too critical, maybe the problem is that he's not being critical enough. At the DNC convention last week, Planned Parenthood set up a mobile abortion van. Depending on which report you read, they put to death 10 to 25 babies. There's something morally wrong with people complaining and being all offended that Trump calls Kamala Comrade Kamala when her main campaign issue is support for infanticide. If anything, she should be called Jezebel Kamala, Baal worshiping Kamala, evil Kamala. You've been listening to God and Country Radio. The website is GodandCountryRadio.org. From there, you can get all of the links to the extended video version of this program at Rumble and YouTube. That's GodandCountryRadio.org. Thanks for listening. May Jesus Christ reign. 